Well, hi guys, and welcome to Terminology Tuesday here at the ABMA Behavior Month. My name is Valdis Lard. I'm the Animal Programs Training Director here at the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium. And without any further ado, let's get going on this Terminology Tuesday. When I think about terminology, I really think about it as our professional language. It's a language of our profession. It's how we communicate the best way we can. And just like any other language, we need to make sure we practice it and help each other understand what certain things mean. Every language has a dictionary and we have a couple as well. I uh, added a couple books to this slide. These are the books I go to pretty much daily, not only to make sure that I communicate with my colleagues in the best way possible, but also to make sure that I understand the concepts that are in these books and the words that help us communicate the things we do so well in our profession. And some of our other colleagues are our animals. And so our other professional language is behavior. A large part of what we do is in our animal's environment. And when we interact with them, we are communicating to them. It is our professional language. We set up our environment with our behavior to make sure behavior is set up for success. We provide the consequences after behavior that influences that behavior in the future. And we interpret the animal's behavior. We look at the communication back from the animal so we can see um, how the animal is doing and how the mostly how the behavior is doing. We're really just professional observers of behavior. One of the main things that we need to be careful of is this, the telephone game. We've all played the game as kids, at least I did when I was back home in Holland, sitting on a bench and one person tells you, a story or a couple words and passes it on to the next and the next and the next. And then the last person tells the story. And passing on information is great, but we have to make sure that the information stays the same. Unlike usually in a telephone game, when the information changes a little bit at every repetition, and, and the danger of that is that in the end, it might be different or even worse, it might be wrong. So if in between those steps, we go back to the books and go back to our professional language, we're going to be able to disseminate a, a lot of this great information without having too many mistakes in there, too many steps or missteps in there. So when we talk about behavior, we really talk about, I want to make sure that we refine it, make sure we all talk about the same thing, like going back to the book is a behavior. When I talk about behavior, it's what an animal does under certain circumstances that can be measured or observed. Right, we have overt behavior that can be readily observed. It's walking, laughing, eating. It's what we do with 99% of the time is the things we see our animals do. And then there's covert behavior. It's private, it's inside the animals, it's thinking, it's emotions. It's private, it's in the animal. And then when we look at behavior, behavior is always going on, right? It's this constant stream of behavior. And when we want to, when we want to talk about the terminology, we want to talk about the specifics of behavior, we have to be really clear on which part of the behavior we're talking about. Which B in this stream of behavior is the one that we want to discuss? And when we talk about that B, we want to make sure we de describe it in observable terms so we all understand what that looks like. You'll, you'll hear a lot of people ask the question, what does that look like? And that's not to be difficult it's just so we are all on the same page we all see the same things when we talk about that individual b we want to make sure that we talk about what the reinforceable criteria is if you talk to your co-trainer or your co-worker that person needs to specifically know if i do the next training session what is that approximation that i'm going to be able to reinforce or what is that b what are the criteria that i'm going to be able to reinforce next time when i see that once we've been very specific about what B is within that stream of behavior, with our, which ABC contingency we're looking at, then we can start exploring the A side of it, the antecedents. What happened in that stream before B that has influenced that behavior? There's distant antecedents that are further back and pretty much immediate antecedents that are closer related to the B occurring. And then we have our consequences happening after the behavior. The, behave, the consequence is contingent on the behavior occurring. So how is that influencing the behavior? And there's our smallest unit of behavior, our ABCs. So when you look at 
the this behavior that was trained at Shine Mountain Zoo by Jeremy Dillon and his crew. And you look at the goat's behavior within that constant stream. If we want to talk about this goat's behavior, we have to make sure that we can define when the goat's about to enter the scene. We have to explore what part of that behavior stream we want to talk about. What is that? What part of it? Is it the standing up here waiting for the girl to put um, treats in the cup? Is it pulling it up? Is it eating out of the cup? Is it pushing it back? We're going to be specific about what that reinforceable criteria is. And then um, we can talk about the antecedents, what happened before the behavior, and the consequence of what happened after the behavior that has influence, that is contingent on the behavior occurring, right? So contingent is really the word I want to talk about today for this Terminology Tuesday. Contingent is really overarching everything else we do. The job of a trainer is to arrange contingencies. So when I find a new word or a word that I'm not very familiar with, I tend to go back to my dictionary, even a dictionary of the English language because it's my second language. And when I went to Marion and Webster and I looked for the definition, it says dependent on or conditioned by something else. Right, they go into the, the great examples of payment is contingent on fulfillment of certain conditions, right? Or our plans are contingent on the weather. Those are great examples that help me understand what contingent is. And then when I go to our terminology, our dictionary book, and I look at Paul Chan's learning and behavior, he says a dependence between events. An event may be stimulus contingent, dependent on the appearance of a stimulus. There's your antecedent side of it or response contingent, dependent on the appearance of a behavior. Because consequences, uh, be, yeah, consequences are contingent on behavior, right? So you're really talking about the, the when, if, then contingency. When you ask your dog to sit, when shows the animal, there's a BC behavior consequence contingency available. When you ask your dog to sit, if your dog sits, puts his butt on the ground, then a consequence is available, a reinforcer is available. So the if then, there's your response contingent. If your butt's on the ground, then the consequence is contingent on the, the behavior itself. Contingencies that occur before the behavior are antecedents. Here's the three uh, main groups of antecedents. They all, again, should have their own terminology Tuesdays uh, to be going on. And in Pavlovian conditioning, the specific stimulus is contingent on another stimulus. So when we want to talk about antecedents, we want to make sure we describe B first, right? We want to make sure we describe the reinforceable criteria first and be very specific on which B in that constant stream of behavior are we going to pick out and talk about? Then we talk about A, we talk about antecedents. And antecedents are conditions that immediately precede the behavior that are related to it occurring. Antecedents set the stage for behavior to occur. And so when you look at these goats, it's a great example for me. This is at Brookfield Zoo, and they set up that environment so well for behavior to occur. A lot of times when you have a feeding goat yard and you want to do brushing as well, anytime somebody walks up, with a food cup into the yard, goats really quickly understand the contingency between pushing or jumping on the animals, on the, the guests, and food going everywhere. So what they did here, they set up the environment beautifully to where if you would like to uh, feed a goat, you can go on the outside, feed them on the outside, and they took away that contingency of jumping on people. And you can still go inside and brush them, but there's never a reinforcer available for that, um, for uh, jumping on it with food. Great antecedent arrangement. When you uh, read Susan's Pavlov's Parrot's paper, she says antecedents convey information that a particular contingency is available. It signals that the B, there's a BC contingency available, a behavior consequence contingency. So when you look at this donkey and the farrier, 
the antecedents, the environment is giving the animal the information that if I lift my foot up, when his hand comes closer, there's a reinforcer available. The, the environment signals that if I lift my foot up, then there's a reinforcer available. So once we've described our behavior and looked at our antecedents, now we go to our C, our consequences. And we talk about consequences. There are events that occur immediately after the behavior that are related to the behavior. Really, the behavior produced the consequences. So when you look at Kesha, our uh, hairy armadillo, in the antecedent box, you can see that when Taylor takes a step, that signals the contingency of if I go around all the shoes, then the behavior, there's a consequence available, then I get some treats. It's a constant if then. Behavior of walking closer to Taylor produces reinforcers and a step ahead signals the contingency if I go around all the shoes and feet, then a reinforcer or a treat is available. The going around the feet produces that C contingency, right? If she didn't go around the feet, there's a different contingency uh, to not going around the feet. And we can talk about all that, but you can see how all the contingencies overlap everything we do constantly. So once we've described B very specifically, we've described it as the re reinforceable criteria then we look at A, we've looked at A and C. Now, if we have an, a problem, we can do a functional assessment. We can be very specific, taking that behavior out of the behavior stream and looking at uh, the, the contingencies around it. So when I run into problems and I have this brain jumble going on, a lot of times I sit down and I write down my ABCs just to look at all my contingencies and making sure that I'm still solid. And so when we look at this behavior of Emily and Barry, Barry is the penguin, Emily is the trainer. And we look at the behavior of Barry circling and we're gonna describe B as our reinforceable criteria, very specific. So I write down ABC and a future prediction that I might be able to do. And for B, the behavior we write down that Barry circles, the penguin Barry circles. Now antecedents, our antecedent contingencies what in the environment signals to Barry that if I circle at this time, a consequence is available? What, sir, what signals that BC contingency? And that would be the antecedent, the trainer pointing the finger. The trainer in the environment shows a contingency, be, uh, shows Barry that if he circles, there's a consequence available. And then the consequence is contingent on the behavior. So when Barry circles, what is the consequence to that behavior? Is him receiving a fish, right? If he doesn't circle, there's a different contingency to that behavior. That's us as trainers constantly going back and forth. And now we're talking about, I can do a future prediction. I can predict the behavior maintaining, increasing, decreasing. And so my future prediction is that the Barry will continue to circle when the trainer points a finger. And so what that does for me, it gives a nice little snapshot of this piece of the behavior and a, a lot of others to where I can go, oh, I see where this contingency is carrying the behavior. Or I can see where this environment sets this animal up to go this direction and I would like him go the other direction. The environment is signaling, here's a BC contingency. How can I set that up differently, right? So then when we talk about consequences, consequences are contingent on behavior. Consequences are contingent on behavior. And then we talk about, when we talk about consequences, we talk about punishment, reinforcement, positive, negative reinforcement, punishment, differential reinforcement, problem behaviors, marking, bridging. You know, all these things will probably need another Terminology Tuesday. And we can probably talk another 20 minutes to half hour about all these individual words. And if we're gonna do Terminology Tuesday, we might as well go into our antecedent boxes too. So talk about antecedents, motivating operation, discriminative stimuli, 
and stimulus control and all those things. And then we might as well talk about extinction, where previously reinforced behavior doesn't get reinforced anymore. So basically what I'm saying is I think we just need a lot more of these Terminology Tuesdays and really dive into the depth of our professional language, the depth of our uh, terminology. And so in conclusion, terminology is our language and our smallest unit is our ABCs. And all we do is look at the contingencies. Our job is tracking the ABC contingencies of what we do. And we wanna focus on the skill of defining our ABCs and look for the contingencies. If we don't define our ABCs first, it's really hard to look for those contingencies. So keep going back to that. That is our advanced skill and our basic skill, all wrapped in one. Don't rush to answer any questions or take any time. Take your time working through it. The fastest answer is rarely the right answer, right? It's not about how quickly you know it. It's about how well you know it and how well you can teach it to others, how well you can communicate it to others. And repetition builds confidence. Repetition builds confidence. The more you work with it, the more you work back and forth with each other, the better you get at it. You want to be a better tennis player? Play with a better tennis player. Play with somebody that's better than you. You learn so much more from them. And um, this way, during these, these um, webinars and, and online classes and stuff, you learn so much more. Keep playing with a better player. And uh, I think we all should do that. We all look for our mentors in those places. So training references, I have a couple. Um, these are books I go to regularly. There's a lot more, some websites I go to. And that last one is my personal email. So if you have any interest in communication, please send me any questions, anything else. It might be, my response might be contingent on the amount of time I have, but I will try to get to you um, if you'd like. And lastly, but not leastly, thank you, Dr. Friedman, for the great hours of discussion on this one word. Didn't know we could talk about this for so many hours. Um, and I want to thank you guys. I want to thank the ABMA for giving me the opportunity to talk to you guys. And uh, I hope this week is going to be fun. This month, I should say, is going to be fun, informative, and great. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening. And I look forward to the next Terminology Tuesday.